Well, thank you very much, Philip. Um, uh, and thank you for, for accommodating this. I'm very, very sorry that I can't attend. This is my first time in 12 years that I won't be able to make it to the meeting. Um, and I'd like to also thank Nabeen, who um, allowed me to um, um, see the last talk, which by um, Professor Yufufink, which was very, very interesting and very related to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and so I'm going to continue along this um, thread of uh, the idea of quantification and talk about how this um, can be used to um, derive loss of inference as well as uh, physical loss. Um, if you go to the second slide, Philip, slide two. This is, um, this is, this idea is really captured by a quote from Galileo where he says, measure what is measurable and make measurable that which is not so. And, and it's the, the latter, that, the, the latter part of that, that um, quotation that we're going to um, really take advantage of. On slide three, <coughs> I think that I'm thinking back to graduate school when I posed a question to um, both my professors and, and some of my um, colleagues, why it is if I, I, the question actually involved pens, but why it is if I have one pen and I combine it with two pens, I always end up with three pens. Um, this works with pens, it works with pencils, it works with crayons. Um, I've done it again and again, and I've, I've seen that it, that it always works. If, if you have some pens laying about on your tables, you, you, you might try it yourself, and, and I'm sure you, you'll find that taking one of them and combining them with two will, will always end up with three. Um, on the next slide, um, this works with uh, toys, it works with dollhouses. Um, if you go to the slide five, you'll see that it works with blocks. Um, and it doesn't matter if I take block A and I combine them with, with two blocks, block B and C, or if I take block B and I combine them with blocks A and C, or I take block C and combine them with blocks um, B and A. It, it, I still get three blocks when I'm, when I'm um, finished with this operation. <coughs> On slide six, um, you can see that this also works for, for volumes. Um, here's an example where I have two rectangular polytopes that are then joined by just abutting them. And in this case, the, the volumes add. Um, not only do the volumes add, but if you, if Philip goes ahead to slide seven, you'll see that um, if the polytopes overlap to some degree, you, you then, they, you don't quite get addition anymore. You have to subtract off this, this intersection term that you see there on the right. On slide eight, um, you can see that this works also with surface areas. Um, I don't show this, but it also works with what's called the mean, the mean width, which is the length plus the width plus the depth. It also works with the Euler characteristic um, for polytopes. Um, if you go to, um, so I discussed all this in, in a MaxNet paper in 2003. If you go to slide nine, um, you'll see that this is really the same rule again that we're familiar with with the probability theory. This is the sum rule. On slide 10, you'll see the same form um, in the equation for mutual information. This appears in other um, contexts. If you go to slide 11, you'll see one of my favorite rules. This is called Polius min-max rule, um, where the maximum of two numbers, A and B, is equal to their sum minus the minimum. It's a very trivial case, but I think it's because of that that it really highlights the fundamental, fundamental nature of this, this formula. On slide 12, you'll see another example. This is um, from number theory. Um, the log of the least common multiple of um, two integers a and b equals the log of a plus the log of b minus the log of the greatest common divisor. <coughs> So on slide 13, clearly my original question, why if I take one pen and combine it with two pens, or one crayon and combine it with two crayons, I always get three crayons, is related to, on slide 14, the reason that the equate the sum rule for probability involves summing the two um, the probabilities of the um, individual statements and subtracting off of their their um, conjunction. <clears throat> so on slide 15, we, we go back to a quote from Ed James, 
um, this is back from 1956, um, when he first realizes that there is a relationship between statistical mechanics and communication theory. And, and I'm going to, to chop out part of this and highlight um, what, what, what I think is very critical, and that is the essential content does not lie in the equations, it lies in the ideas that lead to those equations. Um, this is highlighted in um, slide 16, and it suggests that some of these fundamental equations um, are not so fundamental after all, but rather it's the ideas that are fundamental. <clears throat> so let's take this a bit further, and on slide 17, um, we'll start considering this um, method of quantification. And then slide 18, I'll introduce a paradigm shift. So we're going to go, go ahead with this idea that ideas lead to equations. And instead of thinking about laws as being fundamental and dictated by God or Mother Nature, we're going to think of um, order as being fundamental. And, and in this sense, we then impose a layer of quantification on order, um, on some ordered structure. And this Order, the order in this, um, in, um, that's that we're, we're looking at for a particular problem, then is going to impose constraints on our method of quantification. And it's these constraint equations that, um, that actually um, end up being the laws. <coughs> on slide 19, um, this, you can see this is a very nice methodology. Um, when hypothesizing laws, you can be right or wrong, whereas by applying consistent quantification can only be useful or not useful. Um, I don't like it when I can be right or wrong, I'm very often wrong, um, but useful and not useful is something that I can, I can often deal with. <clears throat> and in slide 20, we're going to look at um, what's, we're trying to, try to get our, our hands on what's actually um, at the root of this, and in this case, it is associativity. So on slide 21, um, we're going to consider um, some partially ordered set. Um, Professor Yufufink has, has already explained what a partially ordered set is, and here I'm just showing a partially ordered set of sets ordered by set inclusion. And quantification is going to proceed by assigning real numbers to the elements. And our goal is, is to um, come up with a quantification that's consistent with the structure, otherwise information about the partial order is lost. On slide 22, um, we take uh, take advantage of an idea that, um, that John Skilling introduced to me, um, and that is that any general rule must hold for special cases. So let's look at special cases to constrain the general rule. Um, in this case, I'm going to look at um, two elements of the set that only have a, have a join. Um, so x and y, these two independent elements, join to form x join y. And if I'm going to assign real numbers to these three elements, the real number that I assign to x join y had better depend on the real numbers I assign to x and the real number I assign to y, or else I can't possibly encode this structure. Um, this um, functional relationship I'm going to represent with the function s, which is an unknown function to be determined. And on slide 23, um, we go back to an idea that is, is very familiar to most of us from, from Cox and, um, and Ariel and Philip probably discussed um, yesterday during the tutorials that we have um, in a partial order, we, um, in a lattice, uh, which is a very special partial order, um, we have um, associativity and we can define a join operation and it turns out that the join operation is associative so we can combine y um, join y with z first and then join it with x, or we can join x with y and then join it with z. And this, um, the fact that we can write the same element two different ways, gives us two different ways of nesting this function s when we try to quantify um, the, this element. <coughs> this gives us a functional equation, which on slide 23 um, is, is well known to be the associativity equation. Um, the solution is that you um, can, without loss of generality, um, perform a regraduation and obtain an additive measure. So 
this, this essentially is a derivation of the summation axiom in measurement theory. <coughs> so we see that summation is very, is very important in, in, um, in, in, with a, when, um, when one considers a measure um, assigned to a structure that is associative. On slide 25, um, I just highlight that activity again, and this I talk about in Maxent, um, the Maxent 2009 proceedings, and in slide 26, um, I just have a picture of the, the uh, more general sum rule where you subtract off this intersection term. So on slide 27, we now see we have some an epiphany, and um, and this is um, in slide 28. Um, Represented by the fact that the the fact that if I take a, a crayon and, and one crayon and combine it with two crayons and I get three crayons, this is relate. This is this always gives me three crayons because it doesn't matter what order the objects are combined. Um, this is a due to associativity. <coughs> and in slide 29, we consider now how far can we take these ideas? Where can we go with all of this? So on slide 30, I'm going to first uh, very briefly consider quantum theory. Um, we already, um, you've already heard from um, Philip yesterday um, discussing quantum mechanics, but I'm just going to highlight some of the, um, some of the points that's relevant to um, quantification um, here in this talk. I'm on the next slide, on slide 31, I, we're going to consider measurement sequences, quantum mechanical measurements. And we're going to quantify them with a pair of real numbers. Um, why a pair of real numbers? We don't exactly know yet. Um, one, it works. Um, but, but more importantly, um, there, there must be a fundamental reason. And, and I actually believe that it's due to the fact that there are two independent partial orders um, underlying these measurement sequences. And that you need to um, quantify, you need one real number to quantify each of these two partial orders. Um, you can see this in slide 32. One of these um, partial orders is then represented by a combination rule that you can, where you can combine measurement sequences in parallel. Um, this again is an associative operation and leads to additivity of the individual components um, of the pairs representing um, these sequences. This is published um, by uh, Philip Goyle and myself and John Skilling in Fris Ravain um, just last year. And in slide 33, the other way of combining these measurement sequences is to combine them in serial. <clears throat> if you um, do this in conjunction with combining them in parallel, and then consider um, consider other other symmetries that, that come into play, other constraints that are related to the fact that you want to talk about, um, you want to consider logical statements about the sequences, then you can show that the um, combination rule um, for the pairs is then um, complex multiplication. And on slide 34, very very briefly, um, this is a quick picture of what quantum mechanics looks like. Um, on the left, I have a measurement sequence space, and I'm only showing one of the two partial orders, the partial order where um, you're taking a parallel combination of, of two measurement sequences, A and B. Each of these sequences are quantified by uh, a pair of numbers, or, or you can think of them as complex numbers, but it's a, it's a pair with a particular addition and, and multiplication rule. Um, and on the right is the statement space, which is the Boolean space of, of logical statements that you can make about the sequences. And you can show that, um, that the various symmetries um, lead you to the Born rule, where the probabilities of statements are are um, found by taking the modulus square of these these pair, and um, the disjunction of two logical statements. Um, in this case, um, a bold face A and B um, can be found just by summing the probabilities. <coughs> On the next slide, I'm going to consider events. Um, so we're going to take this a little bit further than what we've already published. And in slide 36, I'm going to introduce the idea of just consider a chain of elements. So these, these elements are ordered. Um, this is a total order. 
and we're going to quantify them with a non-decreasing sequence of real numbers. Uh, here I'm just using integers. It's the easiest thing I can do, and it illustrates the point. Um, and we're going to consider the question, how about one can quantify an interval on the chain? So on the next slide, <coughs> an interval, let's look on, if you look on the left, consider the interval uh, defined by the endpoints um, labeled with the numbers 3 and 5. Um, this interval um, is actually considered as the set um, of the, the two endpoints and everything in between them. Um, so it would be the set that contains the element labeled with 3, the element labeled with 4, and the element labeled with 5. Um, now we can concatenate intervals, and in this case I'm going to look at concatenation where they share by a um, single um, endpoint. So the interval 2 comma 3 is going to be concatenated with the interval 3 comma 5 to yield the interval 2 comma 5. <coughs> On the next slide, on slide 38, you can see that um, concatenation is associative and that this implies that quantification of these closed intervals has to be additive. Um, so um, you basically get a sub rule and in general for intervals that um, may overlap to some degree. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the, you see the more general sum rule where you add the, um, add the valuations or the quantities that represent each of the two um, intervals being concatenated and you subtract off of their um, intersection. On slide 39, um, we can go a bit further and we can require that the quantification of an interval depends on the labels that we assign to the endpoints. And if you do this, you can very easily show that the, um, the unique solution is the, literally the difference between the endpoints. So for an interval labeled with A and B, for an interval related with A and B, um, the um, difference is B minus A. So here we go back to the chain where we concatenate the closed intervals. Um, the interval 2, 3 is butted with the interval 3, 5, and we get the interval um, 2, 5, <coughs> and the quantity um, that we use to quantify this, the resulting interval is basically given by 5 minus 2. So if you look at 2 minus 3, basically this is going to be quantified. Um, this gives you 1. 3 minus 5 gives you 2. And again, we see that 1 plus 2 equals 3. If we go to slide 41, we can see in, um, we're going to consider a more general interval. Um, this interval is not on the chain in, in this partially ordered set. And, um, but may be related to the chain in the sense that um, it, it has, um, it projects to the chain um, <clears throat> such that there is an element on the chain that includes, there's a least element on the chain that includes each of the endpoints of the interval, and there is a, also a greatest element of the chain that is included by the endpoints of the interval. So the interval could be quantified by two numbers. It can be quantified by the number x, and it can become quantified by the number y. Um, and so the measure that we're going to assign to this interval um, is given by um, s of x, y, some unknown function s. Here's another um, interval that projects in the same way. And now if we look at the two um, joined together, we see that s of 2x comma 2y equals 2s, um, 2 of s um, xy, 2 times s of xy, sorry. <clears throat> so this is another functional equation, and this is a new one for us. Um, we've been working with the associativity and distributivity for a while, but this is called the homogeneity equation. And this was solved by Excel and Dombrace in 1989, and the um, in the case where it is symmetric with respect to um, x and y, so that you can interchange the two, um, the solution is um, the square root of x times y. <clears throat> so 
So if we go to slide 45, um, we now see for, for these general intervals, we can quantify them by just taking the product of the pair and taking the square root. Um, for what I'm going to call collinear intervals, this scalar quantity has this additive <coughs> on slide 46. Um, it gets more interesting when they're not collinear. Um, in this case, I'm going to consider an interval A that projects to, um, that's quantified by the pair of xy, and the interval B that um, is quantified by wz, um, such that the results is an interval C quantified by, by the sum of the two pairs. And if you then um, look at the use of the rule that we just derived for quantifying each of these individuals independently, you can see that the, um, you're going to use the same symbols that the um, measure that we assign to C, which I'll also call C, um, if you square that so, so that you have C squared, it turns out to be to A squared plus B squared plus some cross terms. And this turns out to be the Minkowski equivalent of the law of cosines. Which is quite surprising. On slide 47, this is kind of summed up, um, and where I show that lengths are additive um, if the intervals are collinear, um, and it turns out that square lengths are additive if the intervals are perpendicular. This is actually the the utility of, of um, perpendicularity. Um, <clears throat> in general, though, lengths are not additive, and that's very interesting. This is, um, this is related to the reason why you see squares and square roots showing up. So, so amplitudes are square roots of probabilities. Um, you see in information theory, when you consider the Fisher information metric, you can write this as square roots of probabilities. Um, it's the square root of the probability is a more fundamental concept um, in that sense. <clears throat> On slide 48, um, we're going to go deeper down the rabbit hole and see where this leads us. And in slide 49, um, we're going to consider this general interval that's quantified by delta P and delta Q. And um, one can actually write this pair as a sum of a symmetric pair and an anti-symmetric pair. And it turns out the symmetric pair um, is basically results in can be um, described by a chain that um, projects um, by a chain that, that is basically chain-like so that it projects um, onto um, the chain P um, in a way that you get the same projection for both the, the, the forward and backward projections. The anti-symmetric pair is the other one. Um, that one, you get a reversal, so you get a minus sign in here. And when you compute the scalar, you just take the product of these pairs and you can show that the scalar representing the, the um, interval um, BA um, is delta B times delta Q. This is the scalar squared. And that's equal to the, um, the um, symmetric um, length squared minus the anti-symmetric length squared. So this, this, this is actually where the, here's the, where the Minkowski-ness of it all comes in. It's from this minus sign in this anti-symmetric term. And if you take this even further, you can show that this leads to the mathematics of special relativity, including Lorentz transformations, which is really quite shocking. <clears throat> On slide 50, um, you can introduce a dimensional representation, we call it, where you actually use two chains to quantify an interval. Um, these chains have to be coordinated in the sense that they're going to provide the, the same measures when they're used to, when they, um, quantify the same interval. Um, if you have this added constraint, um, then, then you can start to add, introduce the concept of dimensions to a partially ordered set. Um, it turns out that since each interval can be represented by four numbers, one can only introduce a um, maximum of three coordinated pairs, which gives you um, three spatial dimensions. So this is, this is quite interesting that you get um, three, three spatial or three anti-symmetric um, yielding dimensions out of this. <clears throat> so, so let's put some of these ideas together now on slide 51. And we can consider um, quantum mechanics along with these, this, this uh, mathematics of, of intervals. Um, 
imagine that we have an electron that transitions from some state X of I to some state X of F. Um, and, and it does this by, by um, communicating. Maybe imagine these connections in the partial order set as some, some communication, either photons or neutrinos or something like this. Um, and, but let's imagine that it does so in a discrete fashion. That, um, because the partial root set itself is discrete. Um, so in this in this um, in this case, the electron then makes some kind of tra uh, a series of transitions. It makes a transition first that projects onto the p chain. So this gives us what we'll call a delta p. It then makes a transition to the upper left, where which gives you a transition or a, a projection onto the q chain. So we'll call that delta q. And then it makes a transition again to the upper right, um, giving us a, uh, another projection onto delta p. Now the electron doesn't need to be zigzagging back and forth like this. Um, this is just this is this representation is an artifact of the um, fact that it's being, uh, if you will, observed by the two chains, um, and, and 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 in a discrete fashion. So the if you then um, see how delta p is related to delta t and delta x. Um, you can you can show very quickly that because delta p equals um, we'll say delta p equals delta, um, then you will get um, delta p equals delta and delta q equals zero. In that case, it's a delta e t equals delta over two. Delta x is delta over two. Um, when you consider the delta q move, um, you get minus delta over two. You get the opposite sign. So when you consider these all together and quantify this interval, you you can um, quantify it in terms of deltas p and delta q. So it would basically be two delta p um, in common delta q. Um, or we can transform to a, an xt representation by looking at these symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations. And in this case, um, delta t is uh, three delta over two, and delta x is um, just a delta over two. Now it turns out there's several ways to to make this transition. Um, to represent this interval. And here are the three different um, sets of moves. One is a, a, is a PPQ move, that's the upper left. Um, and we're on slide 52, I'm sorry, Philip. On the upper right is, is the uh, QPP move. And on the bottom is the PQP move. Okay, thank you. And so these are the three different um, patterns of, of communication, if you will, that the two observers might, or information that the two observers might be able to get about the electron making transitions. And so if you want to compute the, um, if you want to compute the probability that the electron is going to make some transi transition from X of I to X of F, you would then assign to each of these, each of these um, sets of, of combinations of moves, um, complex numbers, you would then use the Born rule, and then you would, you would um, or I'm sorry, you would, you would assign complex numbers. You would then sum them together, and then you would use the Born rule to get up the probabilities. So you can, so you can um, do quantum mechanics in this way. And this is how this, um, this framework with partial order sets is related to the Feynman checkerboard problem. You can see that I've suggestively drawn in the checkerboard at an angle here. Um, so we expect that this will lead to um, quantum mechanics and special relativity and give us the Dirac equation. And, and Professor Earl is going to talk about this in the next talk. Um, on the um, next slide, slide 53, I'll just summarize um, what we've been talking about. Um, basically, order constraints um, quantification. So the idea is that you have some set of elements that have associated with it some partial order, um, and you want to quantify those elements. And those that your your method of quantification is subject um, has to be subject to the, 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 the this ordering relation. If it's not, you're not quantifying the order. Um, so the order places constraints in quantification, and these constraints appear as constraint equations, which we then interpret as laws. Um, the results of this are you know, here in the list. Associativity leads to additivity. Um, we get squares and square roots both being important when we consider intervals. Um, we get Born rule, we get metrics, we get quantum
one amplitudes of probability, lengths and lengths squared, um, and the geometry of space time. This is what we've done so far. Um, we're now interested in seeing if we can get relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, is it possible to get gravity and electromagnetism this way? Um, there's some hints that it may actually be possible. On the last slide, I'd really, uh, first and foremost, like to thank Philip Goyal for, for setting this up for me. And, um, and I'd like to thank my collaborators, Keith Earl, Philip Goyal, John Skilling, Nusha Bahreini, and Seth Chaikin, as well as um, my colleagues and my students who um, I've had uh, wonderful conversations with. Thank you very much. You can, you can hear uh, yes. Robert Newman speaking. Oh, hi, Robert. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, just a question. Um, real numbers versus discrete. Um, how important is it that things be real or not? It seems to me that it's not important, but uh, I'm just interested in, in your view. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, if, if you, let's say let's say we stuck with the integers, right? In my examples on, on um, intervals, um, the uh, measure on the, the general intervals then uh, relate would be related to square roots of integers, which then were forced to reals. So, um, so in that sense, uh, the reals seem to be important.